I think events that have such mysterious qualities like those I've experienced are an opportunity for profound self-discovery and deeper revelation. I was never so much interested in the paranormal or UFOs. For me, it was a notion to start exploring the nature of consciousness that really opened things up. There's no way I could have ever guessed what was to come, but it all came together in the most extraordinary manner. I know I've only scratched the surface in my experience, though. It seems like a piece of a puzzle was given to me, and it would be up to me to find new pieces as time went on. I don't mind if I'm thought of as part of a lunatic fringe. That's bound to be the case with something like this. Like I said, I was never really into UFOs. Now all I can say is I'm kinda still not, at least not in any traditional sense. What I suppose I am is a different kind of UFO enthusiast, and this is a very different kind of UFO story. What I'm presenting here concerns a little known, sort of hidden in plain sight, and totally baffling aspect of the UAP complex. There's no sane sound way to put this, so I'll just say it. By a human initiated process, supposedly hyperdimensional, psychoactive, inanimate objects in the form of balloons and other lightweight things manifest to me and a handful of others like me who notice and engage with them. That's right, hyperdimensional, psychoactive balloons. I just call them anomaloons, or meta objects. In this presentation, I'll also refer to the phenomenon as Aerial Meta Object Manifestation, or AMM. I use the word supposedly not to say that they may be balloons that are released and become airborne in the usual manner. I'm saying that if psychism and hyperdimensionality is not involved in their manifestation, then they are part of some other meta phenomena that I am unaware of. In any case, due to what I can only describe as extreme abilities displayed in these manifestations, I understand that my suppositions about the nature of this incredible marvel may be way off track. As I proceed with my story, I think it will certainly become clear that whatever I'm dealing with here, psychic connection and metaphysics are a part of it. I'm saying these are balloons and they are UAPs, so in essence, I'm saying I don't know who what, why, or how they are. They come in all styles, small ones, big ones, star shapes, heart shapes, round ones, cube-shaped ones, alphabet characters and numerals, blue, yellow, orange, pink, gold, silver, and white ones. Some with short strings, some with long, some without or with many. Some of their visual qualities, like looking partially deflated, mangled beyond recognition, or even torn apart, can be an immediately noticeable indicator that there's something not normal about them. Sometimes a single form will show up, or perhaps there'll be a large cluster. They're basically every variation of lightweight, floating, human-made looking objects you can think of, and then some. Mostly balloons, though. They appear quite a bit nowadays all over the world and can be seen in video content on YouTube from individuals who have no reference to them being phenomenological and who are not purposely interacting with them. In these videos taken with cell phones, they most often appear as high altitude stationary twinkling objects in the day sky. It is not an easy thing to relate at all which is why I made up the term un-UFO. It's good that UFO has been replaced in research with the term UAP. 
but as this presentation is more about a specifically questionable type of UAP, I wanted to detach from the presumption of these things being necessarily of ET origin. My subtitle also contains the word enigma, which this phenomena definitely represents. Because it is so bizarre, so unusually unusual, I'm not inclined to argue or push back at contenders in their dismissals. One online journalist came up with a name for people like myself who in his mind have drank the Kool-Aid and are completely delusional. I decided to own it with passion. He called us the Balloon Cult. In the testimony I'm about to lay out, there's a lot that to this day I cannot explain. Why is it an un-UFO story? The basic reason is there's nothing that I have seen that resembles any type of craft. No saucers, giant motherships, or perceivable craft-like propulsion or hyperspeed maneuvers from the day objects that I've witnessed. I well understand that only a really small number of those interested in the UAP phenomena and who learn about this tiny UAP subgroup would believe that our claims could be real. In one sense, AMMs are even more enigmatic than what one might expect from an ET contact experience. At least the testimonies which describe meetings or interactions with so-called greys and other non-human beings are reported to have some objective purpose to them. Balloons aren't part of the typical ET experience or depictions. With AMMs, there is no intelligence that has revealed itself or has otherwise been confirmed to be the brains behind the operation of these objects, nor is the operation itself clear. I imagine it's a giant hurdle to document these anomaloon experiences with UFO organizations, if one is so inclined, when a balloon is the typical explanation for a misidentified UFO sighting. The fact that they appear as balloons, plastic bags, and other featherweight human-made objects means that the whole device could be interpreted as some man-made technological apparatus. But based off of my research findings, this is unlikely in my opinion. Their appearance as these objects has also provoked the suspicion that they are alien craft in disguise. Though there is an obvious logic to this theory, I'm not convinced of this view either, and as I present more details of my observations, I think the nature of the meta-objects as I've experienced them will reveal some blatant contradictions to this disguised UFO idea. I'm also aware of the dense forest of uncritical assumptions about ETs and UFOs, with all the active YouTubers and CGI experts on the internet offering fake, Hollywood-esque content not to mention ancient aliens and other popular TV shows in the mix. There are many ideas that influence these assumptions. As for UFO researchers, one would be hard pressed to find any who will address the enigma of a UAP that is not an alien craft. So I'm sympathetic with those researchers who get angry at hoaxers and fakes that pollute and delegitimize dedicated research. Even though most might agree that there are known unknowns in this field, I suppose some things simply sound too weird for people's intellectual sensibilities. If you dig into this balloon enigma, you will be forced to totally suspend the objectivity of your rational mind. I feel humbled by what I myself could never have imagined because I, like everyone else, was trained to stay in the lane that is sensible and reconcilable with rational thinking. But we've come a long way in our Western culture towards overriding much of the retentive restrictions and erroneous ideas that have been holding us back. Still, speaking as a balloon whisperer, I realize I am trekking in a kind of paranormal no man's land, too far outside of the knowledge trough that everyone else is watering at, to a backdrop that is void. My intuition tells me that these events, including other types of reported ET events, signify on some level an important reorientation back to the foundational paradigm of our species. I don't believe that I am overstating the situation. The implications to me and to others in this new emerging science of contact are that big. Public interest, their accessibility, and increasing sightings of them in the world all lead me to believe that 
though there are likely many pieces to this puzzle that we don't have. AMM won't remain a complete mystery forever. I'd like to acknowledge other contact practitioners out there who are actively doing field work and are proliferating knowledge. There are a number of them who produce research and excellent quality footage of their results, and even some who have already been chosen to represent the phenomenon on mainstream TV UFO programs. Not surprising to see that some have been celebritized and are getting paid from the exploitation of the practice. In popular media, they are being used to present a sensationalized, fear-slanted alien hype for the purpose of marketing. It's a story that's truly out of this world. Navy ships and pilots capturing images about their experiences with what they claim are UFOs. These days, news reporting of UAPs on TV is at a high. With the all-pervasive use of cell phone cameras, it's not so unusual to see footage of AMMs featured as a final quirky segment at the very end of a local newscast. Many AMM photos have also been captured by commercial pilots and the military. Pay attention to the following images and commentary. Destroyer. Other cell phone images taken by a Navy pilot flying near Australia in March 2019 show three unidentified crafts reportedly performing extraordinary capabilities, like staying stationary in high winds. Investigative filmmaker Jeremy Corbell... It's funny to me how this report was worded. It actually reveals the un-UFO using the term craft, but also saying they are having capabilities like not being affected by the wind. Things that you would expect, like balloons or basic drones. Well, I've never heard of any description of UFOs being affected by the wind, really. This sounds to me like there was a witness to something that looked like a balloon, yet displayed anomalous, unexplainable qualities. Here's a graphic comparison of the so-called craft with the boxed image on the right, clearly a Batman balloon, yes? But a regular Mylar party balloon fully inflated at 35,000 feet? Extremely unlikely, if not impossible. Mr. Corbell's comment that officials had ruled out balloons, to me, adds to the confusion of the overall report, which includes the footage of actual craft-type objects like that of the now popular USS Nimitz Tic Tac footage. Well, uh, let's take another trip back into the realm of paranormal tonight. On at least one occasion, though, back in 2005, the wink winks and doubts of one TV news reporter turned into amazement. About extraterrestrials. So we sent action news reporter Mike Devlestrito to check it out. These beings are here. They are here. They're just sitting right up there. We met up with Prophet Yahweh, seer of Yahweh, at Doolittle Park off Lake Mead. We picked the day, we picked the time, and we picked the location. Everyone's going to think you're absolutely nuts. Well, I thought I was absolutely nuts. Until he says he saw UFOs. Over the years, 1,500 of them. Can we make it uh, 1,501 today? What do you think? I'll try it. He says the voice in his head told him to go public now. So we took him up on his offer, and we scanned the skies. Nothing but a few clouds. When the prophet started praying for a sighting, I wasn't exactly convinced. I pray, oh Yahweh, that you sent a sighting so that they know that I am not mentally ill. I am not a false prophet like those who seek to kill me say I am. I see something straight up. Oh, brother, look at it. There it is. You can barely see it, a white speck. Then another sighting. There it is. I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. Photojournalist Jonathan Hawkins locks in on it. Let's take a closer look here. It's an orange sphere that appeared out of nowhere. I call the boss with an unexpected change in my story. I'm t I can see it clear as day. In fact, it's bright. I can't believe this. It wants to be seen. Extraterrestrials? Angels? All I could say for sure is these are the anomalies of my experience. Their very existence is inscrutable and equally difficult to put into words. Yet the whole experience of this AMM phenomena seems somehow common to me now. These meta-objects are a thing of great complexity. Still, their appearance might be deemed as banal for the adept esotericist. Some believe that anomalies are actually living, shape-shifting, camouflaged creatures, a theory established as far back as the 1950s by the late researcher and author Trevor James Constable, who called the objects he observed critters and living UFOs. 
This idea was attractive to me early on in my experiences. I imagined that these things existed in a kind of invisible planetary biosphere, some sort of astrobiological life form. As time went on, I thought maybe they were more akin to apports, which are defined in parapsychology as material objects that have been produced through a psychokinetic process. Both ideas are plausible, I suppose, but turning my focus away from what they are, I began to think more about how they exist, which led me to the realization that they're enveloped in a much deeper and dynamic quality, which I'll detail as we proceed. Initiating contact is a practice that is completely freeform and adaptive. From my experience, I have learned that there is no formal meditation needed, no specific process or protocol that one must adhere to to achieve the amazing basic objective, a psychic connection which manifests a meta-object appearance in the sky. It was a Saturday evening, March 25th, 2017, and I was still living in Miami. Everything started with a simple notion I heard from a man named Robert Bingham out of California. His was the first video I saw on YouTube which inspired and instructed me to try this thing called UFO summoning. I only found Bingham's video because the older prophet Yahweh video coincidentally came up in my recommendation list on YouTube. It had been many years since I had watched it and I had all but forgotten about it so I checked it out again. When I first saw it back then I remember being impressed but not inspired because I was not a religious person. I would not think of replicating the procedure because I was not going to invoke any named deity to do anything at all. It took a newer generation of video summoners to click me into the driver's seat of my own journey. Mr. Bingham's video came up in the side menu, so I watched, and what caught my attention immediately was that his process did not involve any religious invocations. This was a green light for me, and I wasted no time. I went outside that Saturday night and upon trying for the first time, I had success within 10 seconds. Directly overhead there appeared two dim lights looking like moving stars traveling slowly past each other as if they were on a two-lane highway. Then they faded and disappeared. I had to laugh. I couldn't believe it. To get more confirmation, I went out the very next morning around 9 a.m with the same intention to connect, and again, within seconds, a silvery object went across the sky right in front of me. At the time, I referred to it as an orb. It's interesting to note here, by the way, that the videos of both Prophet Yahweh and Mr. Bingham depicted daytime events. However, me not thinking anything of it made my first attempt in the evening. It was later that I realized that all of Bingham's videos were of daytime events. Conversely, once I discovered the term CE5, I immediately noticed that those who used that method were engaging in evening events only. It's interesting to me that to this day I know few people who tend to both day and evening contact events. I'll present some of my evening events in an upcoming section. On that first day later in the afternoon I called a friend over to experience it with me and again, instantly a sparkling anomaloon appeared in the sky. Then the next day with great enthusiasm the two of us repeated the summoning process. Moments later, three identical-looking balloons with massive-looking tethers cruised over in single file down the center of the street in front of my home, one after the other like a troop. My friend started running away. Come back, I said while laughing my ass off. Next day, and catching a little rhythm now, we called, and again, a few minutes later, a large, what looked like a weather balloon, appeared directly over us in super slow drift. Needless to say, I was hooked and this was the beginning of my role as a research investigator. For the next three years, I was having affirmative AMMs on an almost daily basis. My initial contact immediately provoked me to reflect on events that felt like influential elements of my experience. In retracing my steps, what I recalled first, which was new in my life and on my mind at the time, was an interest in the nature of consciousness. Some suggested to me that my experience with AMMs had to do with me, that somehow I have a special connection that is the cause of my experiences. It's reasonable to consider, but I resisted the suggestion in part because it was plain to see that this connection to the sky phenomena could be had by anyone. In my mind, these manifestations were more generally a matter of human consciousness and developmental processes. That idea inspired within me the notion that humankind could now start to break down ego inflation 
and maybe even adjust its dogmatic dispositions and relate to each other in an entirely different way. I believe that I had discovered a great tool towards this end and saw a chance now for this to happen if indeed anyone with a brain and a heart could do as I and others had done, engage in AMM. The synchronistic connections in the first month of my experience were profound and blatant. Having meetings with individuals that seemed to be serendipitous, including Ray Hernandez, co-founder of the Dr. Edgar Mitchell Foundation for Research into Extraterrestrial and Extraordinary Experiences. I had stumbled upon the first and only academic organization that was specifically dealing with the nature of consciousness and its connection with various human meta-abilities and paranormal phenomena linked to non-human intelligence, and the founder lived only about 10 minutes from my home. I developed a relationship with Ray and Free, helping to organize two consciousness and contact conferences in Miami and interviewing a few local experiencers with incredible stories. Ray told me he had at least one possible AMM take place while he was with noted UFO researcher John Alexander. He had noticed the silvery shimmer in the day sky first and pointed it out to Mr. Alexander, who dismissed it as just a balloon. Ray and I also had witnessed anomalies together on a couple of occasions. One occurred as he dropped me off after a contact event field trip. After about three hours on the road conversing about everything ET and UAP, we arrived back at my home, and as I stepped out of the vehicle, a low balloon was cruising right over my head, then a second in the same manner. I sensed that some passengers that were not really impressed with my anomaloon stories were taken aback by this manifestation. A fitting finale to that weekend for sure. Another AMM occurred for us when a TV production crew from Hong Kong came to my home to interview Ray and I for a program called America's Got Alien 2. 今次我哋寻找外星人之旅途经迈阿密嘅时候，卓飞专登带我哋拜访咗一位可以呼唤 UFO 嘅爱好者 Jeta。身为音乐艺术家嘅 Jeta， 二零一七年三月喺 YouTube 咧就睇咗一条可以呼唤 UFO 嘅短片，即刻咧就非常之有兴趣。仲喺当晚咧，自己一个人尝试去呼唤 UFO， 结果 Jeta 第一次嘅呼唤。At the time, I had yet to develop my current idea about AMMs, but I did my best to accurately portray my experiences. I, I had a success with two,、uh, two orbs, light orbs, what I call plasma orbs, going through the sky at night time on my first try. Jeta 话咧，试过第一次嘅呼唤 UFO 之后咧，佢出亲街都有一半嘅机会会睇到不明飞行物体，而且佢觉得系人都可以有呼唤 UFO 嘅能力。佢甚至咧通过电话教导自己嘅朋友咧去呼唤 UFO， 其实系咪真系咁神奇嘅咧 ？I wasn't special. I knew that this was so simple that anybody could do it, and that gave me great hope that the whole planet would start doing it. <laughs> 讲多无谓，行动最实际。我哋即刻就喺 Jeta 家屋企门口一齐尝试呼唤 UFO， 睇下系咪真系可以 call 到 UFO 出嚟见我哋先。Well, I'll just start my process. After the interviews, I suggested we all go outside and attempt to connect for an AMM. I gave the basic instructions and told the whole team to invoke. With cameras rolling, it only took a few minutes for an appearance. Come to us today, if you're,、uh, if you can, show us uh, uh, an object, show us、uh, energy. This was a really satisfying event for me, a live demonstration and a perfect opportunity to really bring the phenomena to a larger audience. It's one of the few times that I've been involved in a group event with such enthusiastic participants. Many who are dedicated to engaging with UAPs place very high importance in having group events. It's believed that such events are likely to produce affirmative sightings, and maybe something deeper, due to the collective energy of the group. What about that thing? Uh huh. You got it. You got it.
right from the beginning, I had the feeling that this phenomenon was very important, and I thought that more people needed to know about it. My first move was to call friends and to tell them what was happening. Then they too had successful AMM experiences. I shared my experiences with two friends of mine, sisters visiting Miami, who then had this fantastic experience at their place up in Boston. A brilliant AMM parade with over 30 anomalums spread out all over the sky like a curtain. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. That one has color. <laughs> twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six. <laughs> My counting right? My heart is like beating so One of my longtime friends who got involved was having contacts that were distinctly different from what was showing up for me. For example, his experiences were occurring at night only, and his descriptions and photos of multicolored and larger craft-like emanations hovering and maneuvering strangely in no way resembled the star-like emanations that were exclusive to all of my night events. This pointed to a completely different level of interconnectedness between the phenomena and us one that I assume causes or allows them to manifest in some fashion according to specific attributes of the individual who engages with them. This got me wondering how much of the AMM is them and how much is us. I like to ask people to imagine the simplest way one could go about experiencing an AMM. What are some elementary things you might think to do? Be inspired, clear your mind, focus maybe, just ask. In a way, inspiration is the most fundamental of these and it is the most difficult to self-invoke. One is either interested to engage or they are not. Yet when a person has the impulse and takes these basic steps, the AMM occurs. Still, because of the many possible extenuating variables involved in this phenomenon, I can't guarantee that others will have confirmed sightings or experience the same connectedness as I have. Also, there's no way for me to know what ultimate effect it will have on me or anyone else. Therefore, I ask that each one proceed respectfully and with care, at their own discretion. As I stated before, the appearance of balloons of every type as well as plastic bags and smaller particle specks are typical of the daytime experience. The balloon type, which represents the majority of these events, has some significantly varied characteristics in terms of their look. They also exhibit behaviors that most often vary depending on their altitude. The lower appearing ones are usually floating across at a rate which seems normal for the wind force. The very high altitude ones most often appear to be stationary, but are actually in a ultra slow drift. These will defy wind trajectories, which is conspicuous when clouds are present. Moving clouds will envelop the anomaloon and pass around it, instead of the anomaloon moving along with the clouds by the force of the wind. In one event shown here, a high altitude stationary anomaloon seemed to pop, leaving a small speck of its debris just hanging up there in the same spot. Sometimes, if they appear very low, just above treetop level, they may be moving in a trajectory of angled ascension, and by calculating this along with their low altitude, they would have to be released less than a block from my view spot. Yet my investigation reveals that there is no human activity happening in those proximities. I remember I was tired, it was a hot day, and you asked me to summon through the window, and I said okay. And I, I really spoke to them, like I really thought about 
all the things that you had been telling me that you sensed about them, mm -hmm. that they could really hear your thoughts. Yeah. And I, I remember thinking, can you really hear me? Like, if you can really hear me, I, I want you to come appear before us now. I'd love for you to come. And it was so quick. Yeah. I was startled. I think, I, 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 I don't think I know. I gasped. I said, oh, you heard me? <laughs> they were two red heart-shaped balloons that rose up from across the street, um, like from the neighbor's yard. Mm -hmm. And they just came up, you know, into the tree line and just kept going up and came up, came forward also towards us. This is really what made me think, you know, um, that got me further away from the concept of this being something of extraterrestrial origin, uh, more like something that was ultra-terrestrial, that this could be an earth phenomena um, dealing with some kind of uh, dimensional complexity, that uh, multi-dimensional complexity of the earth, of the planet. Yeah. Another strange and somewhat common visual is when two or more balloons are tethered together and a portion of them are partially deflated and hanging down. This seems to suggest that they were physical objects subject to physical conditions as the counterbalance weight of the deflated balloons appeared to keep them cruising at a relatively even altitude as they course across the sky. But more conclusive evidence was necessary for me to establish the fact of their physicality with certainty. Visual details like this may not have any significance, but I want to be as descriptive as I can in this section for the sake of thoroughness. Here's another interesting detail. In all of my connections, a number of them have occurred in an incidental manner, without any action on my part. They will just be there in place already when I walk outside and look up. Now, I'm distinguishing here between what is intentional connecting for AMMs and what is subtle psychic wavelengths that automatically engage the individual for an AMM. From this attribute, I learned that one does not necessarily need to proactively initiate an AMM event. But neither do I believe such incidental occasions are simply random show-ups. There is a perceivable level of excitement energy or momentary psychic nudging that has preceded these type of surprise appearances. A large number of incidental appearances have taken place while I've been standing outside using my phone and speaking about them or other high strangeness subjects. So frequent in fact that I nicknamed these show-ups eavesdroppers. The fact that they were constantly on my mind, an obsession that literally consumed every moment of my existence, seemed to have been a factor of their regularity. Over time I noticed that the excitement I felt gradually receded into normalization which lessened the frequency and altered the quality of appearances I was having. They seem to only come now incidentally, when I'm experiencing synchronicities or notice any kind of magical unusualness in the daily course of my life. Finally, of all the visual characteristics of the objects, the one that stands out as obviously phenomenological is their ability to materialize and dematerialize. An example I vividly recall was a close range, about a hundred feet, materialization of an anomaly, right where my eyes were looking. It appeared just like a CGI effect would look, an object fading into view from thin air, so to speak. This has occurred in other events, but always at farther, hard-to-see distances. This quality reminded me of apports, though once again, their physicality would have to be confirmed to fit that term. Up to that point, I surmised that they could be holographic projections. This materialization quality alone was sufficient to convince me of their metaphysical nature. At this point, beyond all question, I knew that a random floating balloon is not always in fact what it seems to be. That compelling materialization example aside, I still think it's valuable as a teaching tool to look at cumulative patterns and characteristics that can confirm the existence of sentience with these AMMs, as opposed to them being coincidental events of ordinary floating objects. Here are a few rationales that I developed based on numeric estimations and presumptions about the physical qualities of multiple meta-objects over a three-year period. 
First, I've looked at the volume of meta-object events and had to acknowledge the unlikeliness that normal balloons could appear at an almost daily rate after projecting a welcoming intention. The next most clear pattern is the almost predictable immediacy that AMMs occur through engagement, which I've been able to observe by the number of events over this same period. Thirdly, again, having numerous times observed the meta-object's animate qualities, patterns of their metaphysical actions and behaviors become apparent, like their materialization, their appearance in the direction one is facing, how they defy the wind, or how from many directions one might get several objects in succession after a few minutes of engagement. The fourth aspect is about location. They can be any and everywhere. They've appeared to me in several locations, including other states across the country. However, there's been no distinction as to location that would suggest some sort of special energies of particular geographic positions. Finally, having confirmed that this phenomena is real and potentially accessible to all, it's not surprising to see others engaging AMMs with similar experiences to mine. So considering the above analysis, basic as it may be, it would defy plain logic to conclude that no phenomena is present, that this is all merely a natural occurrence of airborne balloons and other lightweight debris.